Hey, you guys. Happy Wednesday. I'm so glad that y'all are going to join us today on Let's Talk. We've got some awesome things, um, how we're going to walk through um, our friendship with God. And, and re- really, that, that almost sounds almost sacrilegious, you know, if you kind of first say it. But we're going to come back to that in just a second. But Sad, Sadly, it does. <laughs> yeah. But that's what we're invited into. I mean, yeah. it's crazy. And, you know, Scott was going through the news and... Um, I just feel like we both just feel like that we need to, it's just like joys when there are joys in your life, you've been praying for a long time and God begins to answer those, those prayers, or you're in the middle of just praying and just appealing to God and and you don't seem to see the answers. Um, He just found something um, in his newsfeed that I think that we can all be encouraged by, because I think that's what we need to do when we're facing a season in our life that we have to really persevere in that prayer and just trust that, um, that God is listening. Well, we know that he is, um, and it's going to look different sometimes, but yeah. it's really cool when you see um, people just stepping into that because it's a risk now to declare that you're a follower of Jesus in any form or fashion. So you want to share what you found? Yeah, there's a uh, there's a school in Tennessee, and they were told <laughs> by the administration that, that the coaches and or the teachers could not lead the students in prayer after a football game. Right. And that's become kind of commonplace. Um, and what happened was the, the picture that's out there and I couldn't get it pulled up quick enough, but what happened is the student said, okay, we'll lead it. And actually after the game, they met for prayer between both teams. Uh, I, I, I'm sure there are some adults there who weren't teachers, who weren't coaches, but the number of people, it's its beautiful. The number of people that were praying together was bigger than it had ever been. And so the students rose up and said, no, you can't, you can't take away the fact that we're going to pray to our God. And so they did. And uh, man, what a, what a step of faith for those, those kids mm-hmm. and, and a commitment to say, we're going to be who we are. Mm-hmm. And what that says to me and what it says to us is, it doesn't matter where you are and it doesn't matter who, who is with you. You can live your faith out wherever you are and you can make the decisions for these students that fall within the guidelines that have been established, but they were committed to their relationship with God rather than the pressure that was, that was put on them Mm. by the administration of the school. Absolutely. Absolutely kind of like a who who cares you know we're going to do this at all cost you know, whatever the cost may be but you know another another part of that that is amazing to me scott is okay so what if there are a few who are just drawn into that because they see their teammates you know on their knees and they're they're not taking any they're submitting to jesus um and and those that are just maybe on the fringe watching and they are drawn in even that act even that submission right there is such a testimony. It's almost evangelism in itself. Yeah. And that was one of the, that was one of the things that was brought against them to the school board was that there was proselytizing going on because the coaches or the teachers were leading it. So a person of power and influence was forcing people to follow Jesus. And like you said, the greatest the greatest form of evangelism, the greatest form of, of getting the message out to Jesus, y'all, mm. is not through the preacher and it's not right. through necessarily someone coming and participating in a worship experience. The greatest form of evangelism is you and me and us living our faith out in front of people right? and, and just being who God's called us to be, not forcing it on anyone, not beating anyone over the head with a Bible or with an iPad that has a Bible on it. It's, uh, it's just living your faith out. It's declaring how good God is. It's, if you're a part of 21 days of prayer and fasting right now, today is rejoice, mm-hmm. regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what's going on, rejoice. And so It's rejoicing in who God is. It's rejoicing in who you are to God. It's rejoicing in what God has provided for you and how God's blessed you. And and when we live that way, people in the world just naturally are drawn to it because it's something significantly different than what the world offers. It just feeds that. It just feeds, you know, it goes back to whether or not you are a follower of Jesus. You always say it's the ace in the hole is 
Um, we are all created in the image of God. And so it speaks to whether it's residual or not, it speaks to the image of God in, in each person. And, and they may not realize why all of a sudden there's this peace or they may not, it just, it's just God, Yeah, you know, it, it's just him and his presence. So, yeah. So here's my question. Those of you who are on with us, uh, have you, have you seen where, as you've lived out your faith recently, as you've lived out who you are in Christ, have you seen that impact people? If you have, put it in the comments, let yeah. us know, let other people know that God is moving. God's moving in your life. God's right. moving in our life. It's right. not, man, the, the church has done a tremendous disservice mm -hmm. just to make it about Sunday morning. It's not just, a, or whenever the worship experience is, it's not just about that. Right. It's about us living our life as new creations in Christ and letting other people see that. And every day. Yeah. And you know, and it's getting gut honest. And I think those are some of the things that you're going to be talking about in just a few moments, but it's having the willingness. Ah, oh, sometimes it's so risky just to be gut honest um, with one another and with God too. So, and cause that's what friendship is about. And um, man, I mean, it's made me pause quite a bit lately and go, well, wait a minute, you know, Am I being gut honest? You know, so. Well, and what you said earlier, uh, to say we were going to talk about the friendship of God, and then you said that sounds almost sacrilegious. <laughs> yeah. Man, how how sad is that? Mm. How sad is that that we have moved so far away from what God originally intended humanity to be, which is in relationship, deep, mm. intimate friendship, right. relationship with him. Right. And we've just moved so far away. And even in the church, we, we put God at a distance mm. and we're like, oh yeah, I believe in God, got the God out there. And mm. God's like, no, I, mm. I, I, I came to you mm. in, in the form of Jesus. I came mm. to reveal everything that I right. am. I came to restore you back to friendship right. with me. Right. And we still live in that place of going, yeah, but it's, it's, it's God. It's, yeah. he's out there and I'm here. And so, yeah. So that's what we want to talk about today. Wow. And that just affects every other relationship. It, ref it, it, it affects every other relationship. It affects our actions. It affects who we are, what we do, how we think. Mm. Um, so I, I read a story about Jimmy. I read a story. Oh, we just need a little. Is that a song? A little ditty before. I read a story. Go ahead. Oh, okay. I don't know. I don't know that ditty. <laughs> um, that was all new. Yeah. You're here f hearing that for the first time. Before we get into this, Faith, you said y'all been dealing with a lot of misfortunes. Some of the yeah. things not as important. We feel we are blessed compared. And that's the thing. I, <laughs> if If we compare our lives to other people, we're in a better spot than some people and we're in a worse spot than some people. And so we can't, the word happiness is rooted in happenstance. It's rooted in circumstances. Right. And, and we can't, one, just as humans live our lives according to comparing and contrasting our lives against someone else, because there's always going to be someone ahead of us and someone behind us. But it's, it's who are you in Christ? Who are you in this relationship with Jesus um, Brenda put that, that she reached out to someone dear to her, man, Brenda, I am so glad that you took that step. That's, that's, huge. that's true. Uh, a lot of us, God lays people on our hearts. Right. Sometimes we reach out, sometimes we don't reach out and God's got a purpose in that. And so I'm, I'm glad he that does. you were obedient and faithful to that. Very thankful. So getting back to the story when, when you threw in your ditty. So, um, I read a story about Jimmy Carter when he was president hmm. and what the story says, and I didn't go back and check this fact, check it. So it may or may not be true, but what it said is that Jimmy Carter, who seems to be a really nice man and, um, and, and seems to love God. Mm -hmm. And so what he would do is he would randomly, when he would go to different cities, mm -hmm. he would stay in people's houses as president. Yeah. And so, Whoa. and I don't, I don't know Can how, <laughs> I don't know how he chose what houses he stayed in. Wow. But he would there stay. There was a lottery. I, I guess. You know? okay. Who wants the president to stay in your house? <laughs> but he would go and stay in people's houses. And I just had this image in my mind that, that um, 
he goes to this one house and they, they stick him in their son's room who has gone to college and he still has all of his trophies and everything. <laughs> <Little Bainers. laughs> and I, I can see Jimmy Carter sleeping in a single bed as president of the United States, but that, that probably didn't happen. But, um, but anyway, he would go to people's houses and he would just sit with them and talk with them and interact with them. And, and he would uh, kind of find out how they felt America was going under his watch, which Better it's, than a town hall, it's a home hall. Home hall, yeah. It's, <laughs> I mean, and it's that that's that's risky because <laughs> on so many levels. That's risky. So, in hearing that story, one of the things that I thought about is, it's not Jimmy Carter that's coming into our home. <laughs> it's God. Well, that's a big difference. It's, yeah, it's yeah. a friendship with God oh, wow. and he's, and, and God is not just coming to visit. Right. God is coming to, to live yeah. and to reside. And so as, as this was being played out, the question was, wow, what, what do I do in my home? What do I do in my life in my house that I wouldn't want? I wouldn't want Jesus to see. Um, what are some things that happen between us? What are some things that, that, that we talk about or the ways that we act Mm. and God is present living in our home and as a friend. So I want that to kind of be the, the, the umbrella by which we're operating today. God as friend, Mm. not as visitor, not as someone who comes and occasionally uh, calls us up and says, hey, I'm coming over, so we're able to clean up everything and throw everything in the closets and say, oh, good, we got... But he's there, and he's there for you, and he's there for me. And so there are a couple of principles I want to walk through, and I want to take the life of Abram. Um, Actually, it's Abraham at this time in Scripture. It's Genesis 18. And what you have is you have three guys showing up at, Abraham's campsite and they show up and they're kind of standing over at a distance and Abraham sees them. So Abraham goes over and he invites them over for a meal in that culture. That was huge in that culture. You were hospitable. You reached out to people and these people are on my property. And so one, I'm going to invite him over for the meal, but I'm also going to invite him over, invite them over to see what the heck they're doing on my property. <laughs> Um, and Brenda just posted, God knows what's in our closets. And that, <laughs> and that is very true. God knows what's in our closets. We, we, we can shove it in there as much as we want and pretend everything's clean. <laughs> and God knows what's in there. And Jesus actually spoke to that. He, he said to the uh, religious leaders, he said, you are whitewashed tombs. Mm. You appear clean on the outside, but on the inside, you're not and that's that's really what it means. I that's the question that we have to deal with in regard to God um being our friend. And so in the story with Abraham, he invites him over. He goes to Sarah and he said, "Hey, I want you to make some bread for our friends." And then he went out and got a calf and brought it in and had it prepared by the servants. So it says they had yogurt and milk and bread and and meat and and they laid out this huge spread for these three guys. Well, we find out later in scripture that one of the guys is the Lord. And they're there to look over Sodom and Gomorrah and decide what they're going to do with Sodom and Gomorrah. And so in this story, we see a little more evidence of what it looks like to be a friend of God. And so the first principle that I want us to talk about is for us to be a friend of God, we have to be reconciled with God. And if you look in scripture, it says in over in Romans, Paul talks about this, that we are enemies with God. He even says, while we were enemies with God, Christ died for us. And so out of that, that enmity or that, that anger toward angst or whatever, um, we have to be reconciled back into that. And that's one of the passages that we read from on Sunday. It's Romans 5, I think 10 and 11, that says our friendship has been restored with God through Jesus. And so this new relationship, and that's what Paul calls it, this new relationship that we have is a friendship with God. And so 
If you believe in Jesus, if you follow Jesus, you are reconciled, not just back to God, not just for heaven's sake, not just for eternity, but you're reconciled back to God in friendship now. And, and so that's what, it, that's what it requires is that being reconciled. We talked about repenting on Sunday morning. And there, I, I, I see it in our culture. I see people talking as if they have a relationship with God, and yet they don't see Jesus as Lord. And so they're not reconciled back to the God as they know him because the only reconciliation that we have is through Christ. I think one of the most beautiful stories that I've ever heard um, that kind of makes me think about that, knowing him, is a story of a couple who had been married for a very long time, like 65 years. They were very old and they had spent all this time together and it it had only been them. um, And how she knew, the wife knew, as did the husband, every um, curve of her body or of his body to the degree of where he had a mole or where she had a mole or um, how the toe looked a certain way. And um, I know that's really weird. But it really. No, I can relate. Yeah. Okay. That's not nice <laughs> right now. Um, how that can really, um, to know someone that well or intimately is so huge. And that's the kind of knowing that we're talking about here. And, and so my question to us is how many friends do you have who can say, um, I know Marcy's going to respond this way to this. And I know that's not her heart. To me, that's the same thing as saying your toes crooked that nobody else sees, but they know who you are. Yeah. I, I, tell me if this is what you're saying, okay. that that someone is reconciled with God and yet they still struggle with their sinful nature. And right. so when I, we, they make a, a, a bad decision, right. instead of looking at them and, and castigating them mm-hmm. and and uh, speaking and thinking ill of them, mm-hmm. we look at them and say, no, they're a new creation. That That's not who they are. Yeah, because, I mean, God, to, to have that, it, as Brenda said, he knows everything in your closet. Um, that's what he does f- for us right. all the time. Right. And that, to trust in that relationship, just kind of overwhelms me. It, that should flow into everything else. But in our flesh, many times we do completely the opposite. So that's the first thing is to, to have a friendship with God. You have to be reconciled with God. Again, it's Romans 5, 10 through 11, I believe. And so if you want to read that passage and that passage will confirm and satisfy the fact that if you are in Christ, if you're a follower of Christ, if you believe in Jesus, you've been reconciled to God. It doesn't mean, and this is what Marcy's talking about, it doesn't mean that everything's fixed. It doesn't mean that you stop completely sinning. It doesn't mean that you're not going to do something wrong. Oh, right. It just means that you are a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. I need that. I desperately need that. And I need it not only in my relationship with God, but I need it in my relationship with Marcy for her to understand that that. When I do something stupid, that's not really who I am because I'm in Christ and I'm a new creation. I've been reconciled. The second, the second part of friendship with God that I want us to talk about, and it's really simple because it's true about every relationship that we have, is it's being available. It's understanding that this is going to take some time, some energy, some effort, some intentionality, some resources. Everything that matters to us takes those things. And so to have a friendship with God requires that. And the question really is, so what does that look like to be available? Well, Um, I think it starts with kind of, if you have been a part of 21 days of prayer and fasting, it starts with that. You know, that's not the end all. That's not everything. But it starts with making that effort to prioritize that relationship in your life. And it can look very differently but a lot of the components that we have used in every one of these days are vital, necessary to deepening a 
that friendship with God. Yeah, and in a simple way, it's setting aside a time, a place, and making a plan. It's We talked about it Sunday. We talked about it multiple times. Let me see your schedule, and mm-hmm. I can tell you what's important to you. Right. And this is true, whether it's our friendship with God, whether it's my relationship with Marcy, whether it's my friendship with you. Um, it, it takes time. It takes effort. It takes intentionality. Mm. It takes resources. It takes sacrifice because it's no longer about you. No. It's about your friendship with the other. And so. Wow. It, and that's so different. I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's so different from the world that we're in right now. And so I don't want to make light of this, that decision that you make. I mean, just make the decision and know that it's going to be contrary to everything that you will experience right now in our world. Yeah, because the world, it's it's about me. Right. Always. I mean, that's the most important thing is me, me, me. <laughs> uh, and faith, it does take commitment. Um, you know, the question I have in regard to that is what does commitment mean in our culture today? What does it mean to be committed to something? Mm. Um, I, I, when, when I was growing up, if you committed to something, you saw it through to the end, whether if, if you committed to something in a weekend, you're like, ah, I really don't like this. In my household, you followed it through to the end. Okay. So faith saw mine. So everything that we've been through, Ida, another like crazy thing in the, in the ocean coming our way, all this stuff. Um, She was so bent on being with the ladies who get together on um, Tuesdays to study the word of God. (laughs) She literally drove a truck because their vehicles were out of service. She drove her son's truck that had the brake light on the whole time. And she's like, I can do it because I want to be with these ladies and I want to go and meet God with them. And I just love that story. It makes me laugh every time because I can just see her doing it. And that's awesome. (laughs) That's that's what we're talking about this week, which is our covenant friendship with one another. Right. It begins with God, our friendship with him, right. but then it, and so faith, what you're saying is you, you have a friendship with those women and you wanted to be with them. And so you were, <laughs> you were going to be committed to that. Um, so it's being available for it. And so how available are you to God? Mm-hmm. How available are you to that friendship and how, how accessible are you? And y'all, <laughs> We know it. We will make time for what's important. And a lot of times what's important in our lives is kind of mindless, unnecessary uh, time. Faith, you just said, I carved out time in my morning to spend time with God. That that's so important. That's really the priority above any other relationship. And, And what you're doing is you're cultivating and nurturing that on the front end of your day knowing that it has impact on the other relationships and friendships that you have. You know, and in your family too. So there's a wonderful time that I get to spend with the Lord. And it's taken a long time getting into the the commitment, becoming a habit, like breathing out and breathing yeah. in. Yeah. But a, a blessing. Wow. Is that all right. You know, we were X amount of days, 12 days without electricity. And, and our kids, Austin and Jess, were so sweet and kind to allow us to stay with them. Um, so that first morning that we were there, <laughs> I got up and the coffee was brewed because our son knew that's kind of what mom did in the morning. So there was coffee that was brewed and I was very, um, you know, wow. Grateful, <laughs> proud. Touched. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, the rest of the time I was making my own coffee, but the point was. <laughs> he loves us. Well, that's what we know. Okay. So the third point, I want to get through this because we're, we're almost out of time. I'm sorry. Um, friendship with God requires being hospitable and there is a significant cost. So Abraham and Sarah were hospitable mm. to these three visitors. That was part of their culture but they were extravagantly hospitable. He went in and asked Sarah to make the bread. She took a half a bushel of flour, which means she made a lot of bread for Ooh, these guys. So good. And, and he went and got a calf and, and, and so they, they gave, they gave what they had mm, and, and they bread. gave Yum. extravagantly back to these three men. We are called to give extravagantly back to God in this friendship. And it's costly. 
It cost them half a bushel of flour, which was which is vitally essential in that culture. It cost them one of their one of their livestock, one of their calves, um, which is is wealth to them. Hmm. And so, I mean, that's why if you read through the word, you see them always numbering how many cattle they had, how many right. donkeys they had, how right. many sheep, how many goats, etc. Yeah. So, so kind of my question is, what's it costing you to have a friendship with God? What's it costing you? And are you hospitable? And I, I said on Sunday that I think about having a coffee table in front of me and having God sitting with me and me sitting across the table with him and having that conversation and that friendship. And I would love to say it happens every day on a certain time. I'm, I'm trying to develop that habit. Because normally I will just pray randomly throughout the day and I've been convicted and challenged once again in my life because it's not the first time to set aside a time, a place, and make a plan to be with God because there is a cost. And y'all, the ultimate cost for us is that it's not about us anymore. It's about our relationship with the Father. It's about our friendship with God. It's about Jesus wanting to be friends with us. Mm. And so... What is it costing you to have a friendship with God? And here's the truth. If it's not costing you anything, I would ask you to question whether you really yeah. have a friendship with right. God. We have, we have moved into this world of convenience. We moved into this world of, of well, I'll, I'll go to worship if it's convenient. I'll study scripture if it's convenient. I'll, and I, I've heard the excuses. Well, I don't read a whole lot. You can listen to it. Um, I don't do this. Well, you can do this. What is it going to cost you? Because there's a cost. There's a cost to being hospitable. Just listen to, listen to the logic of this. There's a cost to being hospitable to the creator of all things who wants a friendship with you. Mm -hmm. how, how small is that cost that the God of all creation wants a friendship with you? It's such an eternal thing, and it's such a concept that is so foreign. I think for me in my life, Scott, you know, that's why I struggled with a lot of friends is because I didn't understand, and I'm still growing in that, I wasn't exposed, I wasn't raised in that personal relationship. Right. That, that, that thing that, that God knows me, that he knew me when I was in my mother's womb, I, I didn't, that wasn't even talked about. Mm. Um. And then, so there's a lot of us who are having to relearn, but God redeems, doesn't he? Not only redeems, but provides. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, Brenda just said, you lose some friends that don't follow Jesus. That's, right. That's very true. Paul talks about, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers for what does light have to do with darkness and darkness have to do with light. We aren't supposed to be, mm. we aren't supposed to be in deep abiding, intimate friendships mm. with people who aren't following Jesus. Mm. Now, are we supposed to be in their lives and care for them and love them? Again, not as a project, no. but as someone that we love and care for, but we are connected to and we are in deep relationships with other believers, other mm -hmm. people who are following Christ, who are moving in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And so there's a loss with that. Um, the last point is this. A friendship with God requires obedience to God. And what we see in the life of Abraham in this passage of scripture is we see Abraham coming up alongside the Lord, which is an amazing picture. And they're standing and they're looking over Sodom and Gomorrah as the other two uh, visitors go down to Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham starts fighting for Sodom and Gomorrah. He starts fighting for their sake. He starts standing in the gap for them. He's like, well, what if there are, what if there are 50 righteous people? What if there are 40? What if there are 30? What if there are 10? What if there's one righteous person? God, are you, are you going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if there's one righteous person? Well, see, what God knew is there wasn't. God knew there wasn't one righteous person, but he was a friend with Abraham. And so he sat there and he listened to Abraham fight for the sake of these people. And yet in the end, Abraham had to step back and the obedience was, Okay, God, I trust you. I trust that you are a just judge. This doesn't make any sense to me, but I trust you. 
and I will be obedient to you. I love that. And correct me if I'm wrong, that one of the ways that the Lord reveals himself that we learn throughout scripture is that he is Jehovah Tenitzkanu. Is that how you pronounce it? Uh, He's our banner. Sidkanu, yeah. Sidkanu. He's our banner. He goes before us. He's the one who fights for us. That's a part of his character. That's a part of who he is. And so there's just so much that we can, um, ah, I, I think I almost understand what people wrestle with when he says that the Lord says that he's a jealous God. He's jealous for his people. Um, cause I'm kind of jealous for that relationship that Abram had or mm. jealous for that relationship that Moses had. Cause maybe I can relate to Moses just a little bit better because his mouth got him into trouble so many times. Um, but I, I love that. That's really cool. Yeah. It's, it, it's, Interesting, Brooke put it, obedience, commitment, and focus mm. is what's needed. And right. the whole idea of obedience, we press, we press back against it. It's, it's one of the reasons that people are walking away from the faith is they're like, I don't want to be, be obedient to anyone except me. Mm, so you're up here. Right. And so you, even, even what you just said about God is a God who is jealous. I've heard people say, I don't want to follow a God who's jealous. Well, here, here's what they do. They couch humanity's jealousy, which is not rooted in truth and true justice. It's rooted in selfishness. Mm. And they apply that, project that onto God and say, that must be how God is jealous. That's not at all how God is jealous. God is passionate, desirous of us, of this friendship. Mm. And y'all, if we could just wrap our minds and our hearts and our souls around that idea that the God of all creation is passionate for you, desirous of you, jealous for you, right. jealous for time with you. Right. Once that set aside time that we said will be, will be costly, but it's so full and so abundant. And again, kind of coming full circle, God is your friend if you're following Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, God has been restored as your friend. What greater friend to sit across the table from? What greater friend to get wisdom from? What greater friend to listen to? What greater friend to spend time with? And so I encourage you. I encourage you to cultivate, <clears throat> nurture the friendship with the God who knows you more intimately than anybody else knows you. And, and I think have fun with it too. I mean, I have fun with him because he's a God who's fun too. And so when you have that visual of him sitting across the table with a cup of coffee, there's a lot of things that come to my head. Ooh, Marcy, I've been telling you for a long time, you needed to get black rifle coffee. Maybe, maybe not. Or wisdom, you know, they're not a sponsor <laughs> or, you know, did you get it? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, that there is a beauty and there's a joy. And that's where I have to come back to sometimes when I get lost in me and not being obedient and not being um, committed like, like Brooke was talking about. But to step into the joy of who he is, Scott, and, and, and that kind of intimacy and laughter. And um, yeah. We all were out of time. Uh, and it's his fault. We love, <laughs> we love spending this time with you. We hope it's beneficial to you. One of the things we ask you to do is to comment, to share this with your friends, share it on Facebook, right. point people toward it on YouTube, uh, new song community dot church. Um, we want the truth of the gospel to get out. And this is one of the most beautiful truths, which is right. God desires to be a friend with us and desires us in, in a relationship with him. Absolutely. One of the ways we do that is our worship experience mm -hmm. on Sunday. Great. And so it's a nine o'clock, 10 30 it's online. It's in person. We would love for you to come. If you don't come, we would love for you to be there online. If you're online with us, we would love for you to participate. Yeah. We got Kate there and Kate is doing Did you do like the praise hands yeah. or, you know, the clap or whatever the case you, may be. You can get up and dance in your yeah. house and yeah. nobody's going to see except the people sitting in the room. And they yeah. may think you're weird, but that's kind of the costliness of following Jesus. Anyway, <laughs> we would love for you to participate in that. We also have engaged groups coming up, mm -hmm. which is our small group ministry. And mm -hmm. we believe that that's really where relationships happen with us, with one another. And we're able to grow in our relationship with God. And so those are coming up soon. So right. you can go to the website, newsongcommunity.church and check in and just kind of see about those engaged groups. Right. And, and it's on the connect part. So just click on connect. Yeah, it's under the connect section. So we love y'all. 
we appreciate y'all joining us. If not, it would just be us talking, which is okay. We do that a lot anyway, but we are so glad that you're here with us and um, you're a blessing to us. We love you. We can't wait to see you because that's really what's important. Going back to Moses and God spoke to Moses as a friend meets with a friend face Face to face. face. And so we pray for you. If you need anything from us, let us know. And uh, if we can do it, we will try. Absolutely. So I'm going to close this in prayer and I realize we're five minutes, six minutes over, but I want us, I want us to pray today. So let's pray. God, thank you for loving us so much. Thank Thank you you for wanting this friendship with us. Thank you you that you're the one who initiates it. Wow. You're the one who restores us. You're the one who reconciles us. You're the one who brings us back into relationship with you. And we thank you for that. We thank you for Jesus. Jesus. And so we pray God that we would set aside the time that we would carve out the space to be able to nurture and cultivate and develop this friendship that you have offered to us. Mm. And it's all for you, but it, it, it impacts everything in our mm. life. Mm-hmm. And so we offer ourselves to you as your people. Yes. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless y'all. Bye, y'all. We'll see, see you, you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.